All right, so the third speaker on this um, sales track is nobody else but Marwin. Marwin from 500 Startups. X, X, 500 Startups guy. Please come up here. He's bringing you all the knowledge about sales from San Francisco. Thank you so much. Thank you, you thank you. Um, that was an amazing presentation earlier, and I'm, it sucks actually to have to follow a great presentation, but I'll do my best. So, you know, before I actually get started, um, this is sort of my established credibility slide. Why should I stay in this room and listen to this idiot, right? So my name is Marvin. I was formerly a partner at 500 Startups. I actually spent the last six years, I started the San Francisco office for 500 Startups. Um, invested in close to 414 companies over the last six years, and returns seem to be pretty good. So that's what I did before. Prior to that, I was actually executive at Yahoo for about, I think, almost 10 and a half years. I actually built and actually screwed up probably close to 40 different sales teams over there um, and ran a couple business groups when I was over there. Um, I'm an advisor and sort of like a board member for several companies, mainly in the ad tech and digital media space. And also prior to this, I actually worked at a startup that raised about $30 million and imploded uh, back in 99, 2000. So I have sort of both sort of startup experience, big company experience, as well as investor experience. And this is actually the lens that I'm actually coming at this presentation. All right, so let's get into it. So unfortunately, this is a popular view of sales. And I actually had this view you know, sort of when I first moved to San Francisco, this almost 21 years ago, uh, sales is grubby. These are people just jamming stuff down people's throat. That is unfortunately the popular view. You remember this great movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? It's an amazing movie, right? And Alec Baldwin's like ABC, always be closing. But you know, you know what I actually realized, and I learned this at Yahoo, I used to, used to I used to be in marketing at Yahoo in my first couple years, and I mean, like, oh, those salespeople, they're like awful people. But then I started realizing, like, wait a minute, these people get paid quite a lot of money. And wait a minute, these people are actually the main driver of anything, of any business in general. And what I also learned during that time is actually sales is incredibly important. Proper sales is not jamming crap down people's throat. Proper sales is actually understanding people's needs and giving it to them. If you do not have what they need, don't sell them, right? And so I think, think unfortunately, sales comes from this view of sales. I had it growing up in Canada, it was seen as a very grubby thing. I actually think when sales is actually done right, it's the most honorable thing that you can actually do. You're providing a service, selling a service or selling a product, for the right people only, for the right people only. And if you're a founder, this is a founder stage as a startup, it's all sales. 70% of your time as a founder is sales, right? You're selling, you know, trying to get employees to join your company. You're trying to get customers. You're trying to raise, if you're trying to raise money from VCs, that's a sales job, right? Everything is sales. Actually, you do sales in your day-to-day -day life, right? So I'm married. And I have to sell my wife on going to a certain restaurant or, for example, want to go see a movie, some type of movie that she doesn't want to watch. I have to sell her on this, right? Everything is sales if you think about that, if you think about that. And so actually as a startup founder, this is actually the most important thing that you can do. This is the most important skill you can actually learn. And so also from a PR perspective, right? You're selling to press. You're selling their story to press. Everything is sales. And so there's a great saying, Ben Franklin, fail to plan, plan to fail. So what I'm going to talk about for the next couple of slides is some basic homework you need to do. And some of this stuff seem, might seem like really simple and very basic because most people don't actually do it. All right, so positioning, right? Great, 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 great book. If you ever get a chance, I highly recommend this. It's a marketing book, but understanding that in this day and age, the category that you're in is really, really important. So when I say soda, right? What's the first thing that actually comes to mind? Probably Coca-Cola, most likely, right? Coca-Cola actually owns the category. And so you wanna think about the category that you are owning yourself, all right? And so for example, whether I like it or not, if you think about accelerator programs, you think Y Combinator, right? They own the category of accelerators. If you think about search engines, right? What's the first search engine you think about? It's Google. Google owns the category of actually search engines. So understand the positioning of actually what you do and what category you own. Other thing, learning to tell your story. 
This is something I also learned a while ago, is that storytelling is probably one of the most crucial skills you can actually have in anything that you do. So human beings, in general, are naturally wired to take in stories. And so I always, always use this slide all the time and I ask people, too many people to ask the question, but I ask people, how long do you think Pixar, you know, when you're, they're making a movie, right? Love their movies, amazing, amazing movies. How long do you think it actually takes them to sort of like animate, like the actual animation process, the percentage of time? And too many people here, so I'm just gonna tell you the answer. It's about 20%. They spend close to 70 to 80% of the time on the storyline. That's why all the Pixar movies, most of the Pixar movies are actually really good, right? Because versus say the typical Hollywood movie where there's a lot of, you know, sort of amazing special effects, but there's no storyline, there's no plot line. So story is actually really important. Learn to tell stories. Because if you think about human beings in general over the last you know, 10,000 years of development, how do we actually remember our heritage? So stories are being passed down from sitting around the, the campfire, right? It's the same thing. Stories drive a lot of, I, I would say stories drive a lot of understanding in general, right? You learn more from fiction books and you learn from business books. And so the storytelling is important. Learn to tell a story. The sales pitch, right? The short, simple sales pitch. I think there's actually quite a lot of stress on this. And ultimately, this is actually what I recommend. You want to keep this as simple as possible, right? Who you are, what you do, for who, which type of customer, and by which type of delivery. Very simple, very simple. Understand your competition. What is your competition? Remember, everybody has competition, right? Whether you're an employee, whether you are a founder of a company, there's tons of companies actually doing what you're doing. And so what I want to understand is like, what does a competitive landscape look like? And then more importantly, how are you different and how are you better? And not just like slightly better, like we're 5% better or cheaper. How are you like 10 times better than your competition? And this is actually closely related to the positioning, right? To understanding what category that you're in and dominating that category. Knowing your product. All seems like really basic stuff, right? And usually as a founder, you probably know your product better than anybody else. That's actually, that's actually what makes you a good salesperson in the, in the early days. Knowing who your customer is, right? You should be over-indexing on how much time at the earlier stage that you are as a, as a company and as a startup, you should be spending a crap ton of your time actually talking to potential customers or customers, right? Almost 80% and 20% internally. Understanding the channels. Once you understand who your customers are or your potential customers are, figure out what are the best ways to reach them. Is it through email? Is it through telephone? Is it through knocking on their door? I don't care. It's different in every single company. And so I'll give you a live example, right? I use this example of this sort of like selling chickens, all right? And you know, just bear with me. I'll go through this very quickly, right? First of all, you have an idea. You want to understand what is the pain point. And this is actually where you investigate your customer, having some idea of who your customer segment is, right? When you have your beta, understanding what are the right features for the customer to sort of solve the customer problem. When you launch it, how much do you charge for it, right? And sometimes in the beginning, you might have to charge nothing, right? Because you're trying to learn. But in general, if you're a B2B product, I would say you're probably better off charging some amount of money. That's a better signal that actually they're willing to pay for what you're doing. And then last of all is actually scaling, right? So how do you actually build this in a way to get this to as many different people as you possibly can? All right. And this is one of the, the most important things as a founder is that I mentioned to you is your first salesperson is you, all right? It's your job. And so worst thing that I can actually tell you to do is to go and outsource your sales to somebody else. You learn a lot from actual sales. Your focus is actually on sales in the early days as a founder. And this is what I've seen in general, having met and talked to a lot of founders and invested in a lot of founders. The best founders actually do sales themselves, at least in the early days before they scale, right? A weak founder, I can pretty much guarantee, especially if you're technical, they go, oh, I'm not, never, not really, really good at this. I'm just gonna get somebody else to do this. I'm gonna hire some American or something like that, right, to go and do this. That's usually a recipe for, for failure in the early days. And so the first salesperson has to be you. If you're not willing to do this, you should not be a founder, all right? You should not be a founder. And so the focus actually is when, as a first time founder as a CEO or any founder, getting the first customer, right? 
and you should do this in general for your B2B, you should charge some amount of money for it because it's a signal to understand whether you're providing value or not and whether there's actually customers for what, who want to actually buy what you have. The next thing that you do is add a zero. You want to be systematic, right? So once you get the first customer, you should actually go and add a zero. Then you focus on actually getting the next nine customers. Then after you get 10 customers, add a zero. Add another zero, focus on getting the next 100 customers, all right? But be systematic about this. And what is really, really important in this situation is actually I think as a founder, you should sell your first 10 customers, right? Why should you sell your first 10 customers? You should sell your first 10 customers because you learn a lot, all right? You learn a lot about the messaging. You learn a lot about the type of customer that actually likes what you have. You learn a lot about the servicing aspect of it. You learn a lot about everything, right? You learn a lot about the messaging and positioning. Um, this is something you can't outsource. And because of that, because you, you've done the process and you learn the sales cycle yourself, it, then it becomes easier to hire in, right? Because then when you, you actually hire in sales leaders, you hire new salespeople, you can evaluate them, right? And I've seen this happen so many times when you actually outsource your sales too early is that because they haven't actually gone through the sales process, they go, oh, this person is an expert, right? So I'm going to rely on them to sell for me. They go, oh, this thing's going to take like, it's going to take like six to nine months before, you know, somebody's going to buy because they do all this stuff. You know, if you've done it yourself, and this is, my best founders do this, they've done it themselves. They can push back and go, wait a minute, I actually sold this product myself. It should only be like three months, right? You must be a crappy salesperson and you should probably be fired and save you a lot of time and money, right? So once you hire more, more sort of like to get sort of like re more sales and repeat sales, hiring, right? And so in hiring in this situation, it's called the rule of two, right? When you hire new salespeople, you hire two salespeople. This is really, really important. Don't just hire one salesperson, hire two salespeople. Because this way, you, it's almost like a live A-B test, right? Salespeople like competition, number one, so it's important to have two salespeople. And also, you can measure them. You know, you find out like, things very, very quickly from a learning perspective. You find out if one person's selling really, really well and hitting their quota and the other person's not, maybe it's a salesperson quality issue, right? But if both of them are actually not actually able to sell, then you, you want to dig in a little bit more. Maybe it's a sales process issue. Maybe it's a product issue. But having the two salespeople is actually a great way to start first. Don't just hire one, hire two salespeople. And so the scaling piece. The other tip I'll give you when you scale, right? Do not hire salespeople from very, very well-known companies, especially as an early stage startup. So IBM, Salesforce, Oracle, these are the worst people that you can hire in when you're in very, very early stage startup. The reason is because they're used to having a brand name behind them and they're used to actually selling complete product and having lots and lots of support. All right? Those people do not do well. They're much better after Series B or Series C, but prior to then, they're going to be useless and actually cost you a lot of money. And I'm generalizing, of course, because there's exceptions to the rule, but this is a very, very common problem that I've actually seen in a lot of my startups. Most important, as you start to scale up, use a CRM system. I'm a big fan in general of Pipedrive, and you know, a lot of people recommend Salesforce. Salesforce actually is a pretty good product, but I usually do not think Salesforce is a good product if you're early stage up until maybe Series B. In, in early days, in some cases, you can probably get away with using Google Docs sheet or sort of like um, Excel sheets. Um, I'm also a big fan of Pipedrive as well too, actually from the region overall, but it's a great product and very, very simple product to use in the early days. But I think as you advance, you should use a CRM system. It helps you manage your process better. Building the funnel, right? Very, very important. So as you think about leads, you heard this term SDR, which is sales development rep. As you have more salespeople, what you want to do is you want to specialize. And so you want to have some people actually actively reaching out and actually qualifying leads, SDRs. And you have the salespeople who actually take the leads and actually go and try to close them. And so what's very, very important is you want to build a very, very good top of funnel. And this is actually where the marketing piece becomes way more important and working very, very closely. I'm a big fan in general of actually having marketing actually run by, you know, I would say marketing and sales being very, very tightly integrated. Um, sounds good, but very hard to do. So one of the things about the pipeline, right? Keep your pipeline full by prospecting continuously. Always have more people to see than you have time to see them. 
And this is actually important, right? Like keeping the top of the funnel because you want to keep your salespeople busy. And most importantly, the follow-up aspect is really, really crucial. This is something that I think most salespeople, they, you know, and I see this a lot when salespeople pitch me, are just like they're really, really good. The meeting's amazing, but there's no follow-up. Founders have this issue too when they're pitching me to sort of invest in their company, but they don't follow up. Do what you say that you are going to do. Just by doing that, that puts you at the top 10%, 20% of human beings in general, all right? The other thing, building some process, right? This is actually also one of the crucial reasons that you need to sell yourself actually as a founder. It's because you wanna understand all the different steps of the process. Then you can hire somebody in to optimize it afterwards, but you gotta do this yourself. You can outsource this. And last of all, ABC, right? Always be closing. So I hope that you found some value in this presentation and that you hopefully understand the importance of sales and this is something that can be learned, right? As a, as a very, very unnatural salesperson, I actually had to go learn this myself, actually also as an introvert. So if I can do this, you can absolutely do this. And so I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Bring it off. Yeah, one second, wait there, because you also start, uh, finished four minutes early. Yep, try to try to be on so time. So we have opportunity to ask some insightful questions to Martin here. So, um, to Marvin. Uh, who has a question for Marvin? There you go. Yeah, grab a mic. Is that enabled? Hello, hello. Yes, hi. Yeah. Um, there is a, a school of thought that in order to help close the sale, you need to kind of have this push-pull thing where you create some kind of conflict so you don't appear too needy. Oh, you mean the challenger, the yeah. challenger sale? This is a, something I find very difficult to, to grasp, how you manage that kind of sense of conflict. So you could elaborate, that'd be great. Yeah, so, so there's this, if I recall correctly, what you're talking about is a challenger sale where you come in and you go, oh, well, hey, you know, your industry sucks, it's so backwards, here are some ways we can actually help you. Is that like there's different methodologies. Uh, well, I think the, the, the one kind of example that maybe is easy to understand is in the, um, this John Daper scene in the, where he's like, okay, seems like you don't get what our idea is, let's call it a day. And he, he gets up to leave and then he got, and the business people go, hey, 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 wait, wait, like sort of yeah, you know, I, push I, pull. Yeah, here, here's of. my take. I, I'm mm. not necessarily a fan of those type of sort of like tactical tricks mm. and things of like walking, up, walking off and leaving. I actually, here's the here's way I think about sales, right? Philosophically, I, I, I learned from the school of actually con the consultative sales, sales method and where it's actually a level of education, right? So I go in, I ask a lot of questions when I, when I you know, at least what the way I learned is you ask specific questions. You know, you have some view about the industry, about the industry and sector that they're in, and hopefully some strong point of view. And my take is that when you come in and you have some strong perspective and view of sort of their industry, and you're asking them specific questions of like where they are, you know, their understanding of the problem, do they even recognize this as an actual problem? Um, that is actually helpful because sometimes it's actually, you don't have to close all your customers, right? L like in my opinion, sometimes I will actually refer customers to other people, um, to, uh, you know, in some cases actually competitors because it's just a better fit. Um, and so I think a lot of it that's actually very much dependent on your mindset. And I have chosen to sort of believe in the mindset of actually infinite opportunity versus sort of like a fixed opportunity. And so the way I think about it, just like, look, there's literally six billion, you know, six billion people out there. There are lots of companies you can be selling to. There's lots of people you can be selling to. And so for me, I'm actually just trying to qualify them by asking these questions like, do you recognize this is actually a problem? And if it's actually not a problem for them, it probably doesn't make sense to sell or maybe I refer them to somebody else because at the end of the day, it's about adding value, right? That's the way I think about this. If I add value to, their, to them and to their lives and making their jobs easier, they will most likely refer me to somebody else. I've gotten lots of referrals, at least in the past, right? So just by trying to do the right thing for them. Um, so that's, that's the way I think about sales. That's the right way to do sales. It's not, hey, I just need to go get my quarter, so I'm just gonna jam whatever I can in, down their throat. That is the unfortunate view, and that's what a shitty salesperson does. And, and by the way, those people don't last. All right, good, Marvin, thank you very much. We have um, to say thank you. Thank you.